Hi. I do have a story, but I just want to pray. If you'd just pray with me for a moment. God, I just thank you for um, just this time that we have together for each woman here and online. Lord, it is not by accident. I pray that you would just quiet our hearts, you would quiet our minds, quiet my heart, so that we can hear you, Lord, we surrender this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have a lot to unpack here in these seven verses, but I want to quickly share just a story. Um, It's a really long story, and it's why this passage means so much to me, but I'm going to condense it and try and give it to you in, in about two minutes. So the middle of last summer... I um, came home from back east, and I got really sick with COVID. I got home, and I wasn't feeling good. And my dear friend came over, and she gave me, as she often does, she gave me a book and a couple of meals. And as I often do, I glanced at the book, I put it away, and I put the meals in the fridge. And then the most interesting things started happening. Over a period of a few days, Philippians 4.4 kept popping up in my life. It was so interesting. It would be in like my emails and my blogs and sermons I subscribe to and friends posting it on Facebook, even my daily devotional centered around Philippians 4. It was just crazy. I mean, I was thinking that there are over 31,000 verses in the Bible. What are the odds that this one keeps coming up in front of me? I think I'm just a little bit slow. So, you know, I'm not reading or listening to any of this. I'm just looking at the titles because I'm sick and I've memorized it. So, I, you know, I knew what it said. But within a few days, I was in the hospital and, um, you know, I'm trying to breathe and no one can visit me except the people in these yellow hazmat type suits. And kept coming to my mind, be anxious about nothing, be anxious about nothing, be over and over again. But the problem was I couldn't think. So I just laid there and watched a lot of mindless TV, and a week later I got home, and I'm so weak, and I'm so tired, and I'm tied to this oxygen machine, and I'm thinking, okay, now what I'm going to do? I'm bored to death, so I thought, I'm going to read. But, you know, the books I'm reading, because I read two or three at the same time, um, they require a working brain, which I didn't have. So I thought, I'm going to try and read the book that my friend gave me because at a glance, it was small, it was an easy read, so I dug through my basket and I found it. Yes. Philippians 4. I couldn't believe it. And I remember, for as much as I don't remember during that time, I sat up in bed and I said, all right, God, you have my attention. And I've spent the last six months diving into Philippians 4. So um, as a side note, When you're memorizing scripture and hiding God's word in your hand and the Holy Spirit brings it to your mind, pay attention. It's for a reason. So um, with that, let's open your Bibles to Philippians 4. I'm going to read. I'll be in the NASB. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved, I urge you, Odia, and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. So I love surveys, and I looked at a lot of surveys during the study, and I noticed that peace and happiness are consistently in the top four things that people want but can't seem to keep. I mean, we all want it, right? And right now... It seems elusive with what's going on in the world stage. You know, there's unrest everywhere, and then you've got the everyday pressures of work and traffic and finances and relational conflict, and they're peace thieves. And sometimes you just want to go, ah! I call my girlfriend, and I just go, ah! And she goes, say no more. (laughs) So we look for temporary peace. We go to a place where we can just be quiet and chill. 
Some people go to the ocean or the desert or hike in the mountains. Some just want to take a long bubble bath. Remember the old Calgon commercial? I live in the foothills of Palomar Mountain, and there's a spot that we call Lookout Point. And um, it's a place that looks over the valley, and on a clear day we can see the ocean. And my dad put a bench up there where he and my mom used to go watch the sunsets. I've gone up there many times in my life just to be quiet, and I just sit there and I just soak it in. But the thing is, I can't live up there at Lookout Point. And when I come down, even though I feel better and even optimistic, the pressures are still there. And worry still wants to knock at my door. We've learned through Paul's example of trusting God, allowing him control, that our lives can be marked by peace and joy. Paul encouraged the Philippians, and us by extension, to follow his example, to watch others who live in the same way, to run after Jesus and not lose heart. Remembering that our citizenship is in heaven, not here, and that we eagerly await for him who will transform our bodies to be like him. I cannot wait for that. Paul writes, therefore, my beloved. So again, we see his fatherly tenderness towards them. You who I love so much. You who are my joy and crown. That refers to the victor's crown that's placed on the head of the winner of the Olympic Games. You who I long to see, stand firm. He writes the same exhortation, stand firm, in his other letters. It's a military command that means stay at your post. Don't retreat. Hold your ground. I think we've seen that resolve this week in President Zelensky in Ukraine. I think of standing against the waves of an ocean, or maybe you've seen a news reporter reporting in the middle of a hurricane. They take their stand so they don't fall over. And like the wind and the waves, we get assaulted by this world every day from every direction. But we are able to, to stand firm when we spend time in God's word, abiding in him, remembering his promises, and getting dressed for battle, putting on that armor of Ephesians 6, so that we are able to withstand the attacks from a powerful enemy whose goal is to what? Kill, steal, and destroy our unity, our witness, our peace. He wants to see us in anxiety and conflict. They're peace thieves. And we can call, we can fall if we try to stand on our own. Paul writes, stand firm in the Lord. Now, I was thinking when a toddler stands against the ocean waves, he's likely going to topple right over. But when he's holding on to mom and dad's hands, he stands in their strength. And our source of strength is in Christ, not in ourselves. We stand in the strength of his might, in his power. And ladies, that is no small thing. That is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. It split the sea in two. It enables us not to sin. It frees us from fear. It's the same power that spoke all of creation into existence from the tiniest atom to who knows how big, and that is so awesome. Do you know that last, last October, astronomers discovered not a new star, not a new planet, a new galaxy, 11, million, 11 billion light years away. I cannot even wrap my head around that. But God knew about it because he spoke that into being. And that's where I want to be. That's whose hand I want to hold, don't you? I love what Josefina said last week. When we hold on to him, he holds on to us. And the more we understand our own weakness, the more we are driven to depend on Christ alone. And then we can stand firm in the Lord, our rock, our anchor, firmly on his promises, backed by his authority. Paul goes on in verse 2. He's urging two women Sisters in the Lord who are having a disagreement to live in harmony. Denise taught a few weeks ago how we do a relational life together to have the mind of Christ so we can treat each other the way we should. That's not always easy because, face it, siblings can fight. We can be prideful. 
We can think too highly of ourselves. We want to fight for our perceived rights and convince others that our opinion is the right one. And feelings get hurt even in our deepest relationships. Because disagreements happen. Anyone with a heartbeat knows that. But what's important is how we handle them. The message puts it like this. It says, iron out your differences and make up. God doesn't want his children fighting and holding grudges. That's your sister. Work it out. Be of the same mind. Too often, I think that we focus on our differences, but we're not always going to agree. And Paul isn't saying that we have to agree on everything. We're going to have different opinions on many things, some even theological issues. What he's saying is live in harmony. Agree in the Lord. As believers, there's always areas of agreement. We can agree that Jesus is our Savior. He died on the cross and rose for our sins. He conquered death. We can agree there is only one true God, and he controls all things. We can agree that we are forgiven and saved by grace. We can agree on the foundational truths of Scripture. As believers, we go back to the cross. That's our starting point. As believers, what unites us is our oneness in Christ, and our motivation should be what brings honor and joy to his heart. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, whatever then you, you, whatever then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all, including our relationships, including how we handle conflict. Do it all to the glory of God. And when that is our goal, then we can focus on ourselves Matthew 5, 7, getting that log out of our own eye, right? When you're, whether you're, whether you're what, asking the question, what is my part of the conflict, whether you're 10% wrong or 90% wrong, take 100% responsibility for your part. Putting off anger and bitterness, and then we can focus on the other person. We can put on love and forgiveness, practicing those one another's that we see in Scripture so that we can have unity with the person we're at odds with. It's not a natural response, and it's often really easy to ignore it or make excuses. And I can't often seems, or often means that I won't. But the relationship is more important than the issue. It's humbling, but here again, it's not on our own. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But we have to take the initiative. Romans 12, 18, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Hebrews 12, 14, pursue peace with all men. Do your part. When we choose to obey and we reach out and we move towards them, he meets us there and he gives us what we need to do what he's told us to do. When we ignore it, and that's easy to do, we wrongly believe that God doesn't see or doesn't care, but he does. We see in Matthew 5.23, Jesus stresses just how important this is to him. Again, from the message, says, This is how I want you to conduct yourself in these matters. If you enter your place of worship and are about to make an offering, you suddenly remember a grudge ha a friend has against you, abandon your offering. Leave immediately and go to this friend and make things right. Then come back. He deeply cares about our relationships, whether it's a little spat or a deep-seated argument. Don't ignore it. It's just going to fester, and it becomes that root of bitterness that grows and grows. It becomes a weight. Lay aside that encumbrance so you can run with endurance the race set before you. Sometimes that means getting a third person involved to get wisdom and navigate reconciliation, and that's okay. Paul calls here... Um, on a true companion in verse 3 to help these women resolve their differences. Whether it's a pastor, a counselor, a more mature believer, these are all available here at church. If you need help, just call the office. They'll set you up. Maybe you are that other person. As believers, we should not only be practicing this, but encouraging each other, building each other up, helping each other, reminding each other that we are to be like Christ. And an unbelieving world will see that unity, and they will see our joy, and it's attractive, and it draws people to Christ. In verse 4, Paul repeats the major theme of his letter, rejoice. Rejoice! 
We've seen it in every chapter. In verses in chapters 1 and 2, rejoice. In chapter 3, rejoice in the Lord. Here in chapter 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So I appreciate words and patterns. When I was growing up, my dad taught us to pay attention to our words. And so we learned that words matter. They matter in life. They matter in Scripture. And we know that every word in Scripture is God-breathed. So I take notice of words like always and everything, nothing, because they don't leave any wiggle room. And this rejoicing is a command. And as we've learned, it's not based on our circumstances or feelings that change on a dime. But it's in the Lord. That's where our joy is. That's the focus again. We stand firm in the Lord. We live in harmony in the Lord. We rejoice in the Lord. Everything circles right back around to him. And when he's the focus, we have a great capacity to rejoice, even in desperate times. So I want to, if you hold your place there, I want to look back at an example of a man in Scripture. It's a passage I go to often when things seem really big. Let's turn back to the um, end of the Old Testament to the book of Habakkuk, chapter 3. Habakkuk chapter 3. The prophet Habakkuk lived in a world where there was so much evil out in the open. The Babylonian army was a threat. His world seemed like it was headed for a disaster, and we find him struggling with confusion and doubt. And he's asking God, what are you doing? We've all been there. We've all asked that question. I don't think I'm the only one. You can't make sense of what's happening. You can't see how it can work out. When I got home from the hospital after COVID, I got hit with the announcement, this announcement that we were going to have to move. Um, It's going to completely change my life from what I always thought it would be. I knew it was a possibility, but I really didn't think it would happen, and I didn't want it to happen. And it blindsided me. A couple of weeks ago, I got hit with another bombshell, and yesterday, yet another one. And the future looks more like a puzzle with the pieces upside down. And I can't see how all the pieces fit together. Habakkuk doesn't see what's going on here, and he has this conversation with God. My mom's friend used to say, turn every worry into a prayer. And Habakkuk turns his concerns into prayer. He pleads for help and mercy and intervention. But at the end of the day, he makes the decision in his heart to praise, to celebrate God. Let's read in verse 17. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the height. I will. There's the choice. We always have a choice. I will not become bitter or angry. I will not complain or be grumpy around people. I will rejoice in my God who is wise, loving, sovereign, merciful, and does all things well, who sustains me and gives me strength and will bring me through. I will foster a spirit of gentleness. I will turn to Jesus and not away from him. I will remember that his presence is with me and he is coming soon. I don't do this perfectly, but I strive to practice it. And when we do that, It replaces worry. I read um, a story from that book that my friend gave me that the author wrote about visiting a friend who wanted to take him up on a mountain and show him this spectacular view. But there was this impending storm coming that he was concerned about the wisdom of going out in it. And his friend responded, don't worry about it. So they went out in their open truck and they started climbing the mountain. It was getting cold and it was going to rain soon. And He suggested maybe this wasn't a good idea. And his friend handed him a raincoat and said, don't worry about it. Then came the thunder and lightning, and he said, I think we need to go back. And his friend said, don't worry about it. They kept going higher and higher. 
And he asked, are we safe? He didn't think they were safe. And his friend looked at him and said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about anything. And those words have stuck with me. They got to the top, the sun came out, it was a spectacular view. But those words have really stuck with me, and it did with him as well. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about anything. It's what Paul is saying here in verse 4. Be anxious for nothing. Some older translations say, for no thing, be anxious. Not the present, not the future, not the past. Those are called regrets. The would have, should have, could have. But we worrying about the past, that doesn't help. That doesn't change anything. I've been on that merry-go-round, and it's a waste of energy. There's nothing you can do about it. Forget what lies ahead, what lies behind. Stra- uh, strain forward to, to what lies ahead. Don't worry about it. It's not a flippant comment, although sometimes it can sound that way. But storms do come into our lives, and we start asking questions. In the future, we start asking what if questions. We're great at this, right? What if I can't pay the bills? What if the check isn't enough? What if work doesn't come in? What if I have to move? And our imagination goes wild, most of which never happens. In fact, 85% of what we worry about doesn't even happen. But there still can be fear of the unknown. And we can feel anxious, but we don't have to stay there. We don't have to let it consume us. And it's not by just stopping. You can't just stop worrying. That creates a vacuum. You've got to replace it. And Paul tells us, replace it with prayer. Pray about everything with supplication and thanksgiving. Go to the Lord. Pour out your hearts to him. Talk to him about your concerns and your needs. Ask him for help. This doesn't mean we don't care. Paul cared very much about these Philippians, but he didn't worry about them. He maintained his trust in God. To care is one thing and to worry is another. That eliminates trust in God. It's a peace thief. I love the words from one of my all-time favorite hymns, and it was in your study, written by Joseph Scriven, whose life was filled with tragedy, yet he considered it a privilege to carry his concerns to God. It says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry what? Everything to God in prayer. God never intended for us to carry our burdens alone. When we try to, we forfeit his peace. But when we do our part, rejoicing in him, being kind, gentle, praying, practicing gratitude. God does his part, and he fills us with peace. Again, I don't do this perfectly, but I strive to practice it, training myself to make it my go-to and not my last resort. And there are victories. Have you ever noticed that when you try to start learning something that God tests you? So a couple of months ago, I flew back east. This was a small test. I flew back east, I had my ticket, and a day before I was supposed to leave, I got notice that my flight had changed, and it was taking me on a different route with an additional stop, and by the time I got to Atlanta, the flight, my last leg, had taken off without me. And it's midnight, and I'm in Atlanta, and I have nowhere to go. And it's a situation that could have caused me to be overly concerned. Did I care? Yes. But I'd been practicing working through this passage. So I was really kind of glad for the masks because I was walking through the airport talking to the Lord out loud. So I was glad nobody could see me. (laughs) But I was walking through saying, thank you, God, for the assurance that you see me and you have a plan. Thank you for this exercise in trusting you. Thank you for your promise that you are near and are not going to leave me. Lord, I'm tired, and I would really like a hotel room and I'm choosing to trust you. And guess what? There was peace. There was. And he did provide a room, not as quickly as I would have liked. I made a dozen phone calls, and everything was booked. And it probably wouldn't have been my first choice. But it was clean. It was a bed. He provided for my needs, my needs, and I was grateful when I told him, thank you. There was such comfort in just relaxing and relying on him to take care of it. Again, it was a small test, and there are bigger ones, like the one I'm in right now. 
things happen that are out of our hands and we can't do anything. And the outcome we hope for seems out of reach. Tori, uh, Corey Ten Boom said, the wonderful thing about praying is that you leave a world of not being able to do something and enter God's realm where everything is possible. He specializes in the impossible. When we pray, we leave the results to him. She also said, Jesus did not promise to change the circumstances around us. He promised peace and joy to those who would learn to believe and have faith that God actually controls all things. There are many examples of this in Scripture. King Hezekiah, when the Assyrians were threatening to attack, he laid out his concerns before the Lord. Hannah prayed over the pain of an empty womb. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego about to be thrown in the fiery furnace. Daniel, in the face of being thrown in the lion's den, continued praying as he always did. Nehemiah, when he faced rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem, prayed as he walked around it. It makes all the difference. And we, like these, like Paul, can show a broken world that a life of joy and peace is possible. And people are looking for peace. And we have the answer. It's in Christ. And the peace of God, not like the world's peace, that's different. It's not a fake smile. It's an inner tranquility which goes beyond our understanding, beyond the facts of our circumstances, will guard. There's another military term referring to a garrison of soldiers on duty to protect and defend our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. When I was in England, I would go, I went to Buckingham Palace, and I would notice, you know, the soldiers that are in their little shelters there, and I'd watch people go up to them and take pictures and and jump out at them, and make faces, and try to get them to move. But you know what? They don't. They don't flinch. They stand there unmoved, on guard. And I imagine the Queen of England is not overly concerned about outside threats, because she knows there are people standing guard, and she trusts them. And when you trust the one who stands guard, we can rest. Isaiah wrote, in Isaiah 26, 3 and 4, you will keep him in perfect peace whose minds are steadfast, fixed on you because they trust in you, grounded, firmly persuaded. You know, that word perfect in that verse is not in the Hebrew text. It's written peace, peace. It's doubled, indicating, indicating the certainty of it. Peace that God grants his children and keeps them in, that is true and real and solid. That peace is only available to believers, those who are in Christ, replacing worry. And that passage becomes more than a verse that's been memorized, but an experience that strengthens us and matures us and comforts us. Do you know that peace? Have you experienced that peace? Paul did. Everything he went through Habakkuk did, Hezekiah did, Daniel, Corrie ten Boom. George Mueller did. He opened an orphanage in the 1800s, and he took in orphans. He fed them, clothed them, educated them, cared for as many as 2,000 at once to over 10,000 in his lifetime. And he never asked for anything from anyone except God. Horatio Spafford did. Peace like a river attended his way as sorrows like sea billows rolled. They were just regular, finite, sinful people like us who lived in their broken world but believed and trusted in a big God in difficult times when they didn't understand and couldn't see around the corner. Billy Graham did. I just want to end with this little clip. I keep it to the top of my it's pinned at the top of my Facebook page because it just encourages me when um, worry knocks at my door. Habakkuk said, Lord, please tell me what you're doing. And God said, no, I'm not going to tell you, Habakkuk. Because if I told you what I was doing. Habakkuk said, Lord, please tell me what you're doing. And God said, no, I'm not going to tell you, Habakkuk. Because if I told you what I was doing, you wouldn't believe me. If God today told us what he's doing in the world, we wouldn't believe it. 
you think God's given up and God's abdicated and God's left the throne? He hasn't. He's still on the throne. And those of us that know him put our trust in him and him alone. I don't put my trust in what. Okay. Habakkuk said, Lord, please tell me what you're doing. And God said, no, I'm not going to tell you, Habakkuk. Because if I told you what I was doing, you wouldn't believe it. If God today told us what he's doing in the world, we wouldn't believe it. Don't you think God's given up and God's abdicated and God's left the throne? He hasn't. He's still on the throne. And those of us that know him put our trust in him and him alone. I don't put my trust in Washington. I don't put my trust in the United Nations. I don't put my trust in myself. I don't put trust in my money. I put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. When all the rest of it fails and crumbles and shatters, he'll be there. Amen. That's why we can rejoice today in our broken world because of his unchanging character, because he is sovereign. He is our strength, our salvation. He's trustworthy. He knows what's coming up, and he fills us with peace. And regardless of what happens, he says, don't worry. Don't worry about anything. I'm not going to let go. I'm still here. Amen? Let's pray. God, I am just so overwhelmed with you. I am so in awe of you. You who set the moon and stars in place, and yet you love and you care for us so much. And saying thank you just doesn't seem adequate, but we say it anyway. Thank you for loving us and holding us. Thank you for your gift of salvation. Thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for offering to take those things that weigh us down and replacing it with your peace, for taking every situation in our lives and working it out for our good, for your glory. Lord, I pray that today we would take your words and not walk away 